Mike, the man is dead. Yes, I know. I was there when he was killed in the Dominican Republic. But Alan wasn't suggesting that it was Roger Thorpe. He was suggesting that somebody, perhaps, closely associated with Roger Thorpe, that was carrying some vendetta against Alan. Well, the Bureau has a full record of Thorpe's activities before his death. I'll have them send it on to me. I'll look through it and see if I can associate any names with him. At this point, we can't overlook any possibilities. Meantime, I do want you to go over in your mind, though, very carefully, those last moments with golf. I will. I don't think it'll do any good, but I'll try. <sighs> Thanks. Talk to you later. Uh, have you uh, heard anything more about uh, Quentin McCord? Well, they sent me some additional information last night on him, but nothing in it to link him either with golf or out Al Alan. I did find out, though, he lived a very curious life. Oh, yeah? How's that? Well, for one thing, he's moved almost continually for the last six years. Well, that could be associated with his work, couldn't it? Mm, possibly, but he's lived in almost every country in Europe, always in a secluded area and always far from any, any town. For example, I remember an old monastery somewhere outside of Florence, an old castle in the Bavarian Alps, and a Swiss chalet somewhere in the mountains of Switzerland. Well, sounds like he likes his privacy. Mm -hmm. Also sounds like someone who's trying to avoid contact with people and just maybe somebody who's trying to hide something. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Bye-bye. I want you to go over your last moments with golf in that cable car. Maybe something he said or did can help us. say something before he fell. He did. But so concerned with staying alive, I can't remember what it was. What the hell did he say? We'll continue with part two of Guiding Light in a moment. communication to Henry Chamberlain from Jennifer Richards. 
report on the progress of the Madrid office personnel. How humorous. Wish I had time to read it. It would probably make me laugh. Uh, on the contrary, I've already looked it over, Vanessa. And Mrs. Richards has done a remarkable job in a very short period of time. She's left everything in the Madrid office in very good shape for Mr. Evans to take over and prepare them for the oil strike when it happens. Don't you mean if it happens? I tell you, it is positively immoral the amount of money that we have spent on that Lewis offshore drilling project. Now, if I were president of this But you're country, not, we would Vanessa. Do and instead of running down the association between Lewis Oil and Spalding Enterprises at every opportunity, I <laughs> think that you'd do well to work toward its success, which is what we're all doing. Good afternoon, ladies. Hello, Hello Josh. Hand around somewhere? We were just talking about you. Hello? Yes, how did your conversation with Helena Manzini go? Vanessa, what the hell are you talking about now? Well, I assume your office has the same kind of telephone equipment that mine does, so I was very surprised when I went down to the basement pharmacy to get a little cup of coffee, and who should I see all huddled up in the payphone but you? So naturally, after I put two and two together and assumed you were talking to Helen Manzini. I think you're seeing things, Vanessa. Maybe it's a result of getting up so early this morning so you could have breakfast with Tony R hmm? No. As a matter of fact, I've seen you in that payphone several times before, and I've always assumed that there was a very attractive conquest on the other end. I guess I should be flattered that you keep such close track of my telephone conversations, Vanessa, but unlike you, when I have a long-distance call to make that has nothing to do with Spalding Enterprises, I make it from a phone booth so it doesn't get charged to the company's account. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really, Josh? Now, that's absolutely untrue. Anybody knows that you can just reverse the charges. Oh, pardon me for interrupting this, but um, I have some very intricate figures to go over here, so if you two want to continue this discussion, I would be grateful if you'd do it someplace else. Oh, oh, hello. Oh, hello, Daddy. Mm. Where have you been? Well, darling, not that it's any of your business, but I have been to B. Redden's. She gave me a delicious luncheon. Uh, and, incidentally, told me about your unexpected visit this morning. Well, I, I told you I had a wonderful time. Hmm. Henry, have you seen uh, Amanda today at all? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Sorry. I think she out for a late lunch, and then she had some things to do for a dinner party tomorrow night afterwards. Mm. Oh? Is this a welcome home party for Jennifer? I understand she's been ordered back from Madrid. Darling, she has not been ordered back. She finished her assignment very efficiently, and now Mark is taking over. But she won't be here in time for that. No, no, this is a party that Amanda's giving for Kelly and Morgan and Alan and Hope and a few other friends. Uh-huh, sounds like a crashing bore to me. Well, I'll be in my office if anybody needs me. And, Josh, uh, mm. I'll see you later at karate class. Yes, she will, Vanessa. I'd offer you a ride, but I have to pick up Helena Manzini along the way. Ah. Uh. Henry, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little later if you have time. Most oh, certainly, certainly, any time. Thank mm. you. Mm. Do you know of any, any calls have come for me while I was out? Uh, none that I know of, Henry. Mm. Uh, tell me something. When you were at the Reardon house earlier, did you find out anything about that trip that Quentin McCord made to London? Well, Nola's staying with her mother for a few days, and I tried to get her to tell me what she would without arousing her suspicions, but... All she would say was that uh, McCord flew to London suddenly because a friend and associate of his had been murdered. Now, I think it has something to do with his archaeological work, but uh, Nola wouldn't say what the work was or what McCord was up to. Why, the more I hear about Quentin McCord and his activities, the stranger this all seems. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Je vous Is there any city in the world that you're not familiar with? Very few. You know, as I told you, I've never had any real, real roots in my life. My parents were very elderly when I was born, and my father, I have very little memory of him at all. Now, after he died, my mother became ill, quite seriously, and it got, it got progressively worse. So by the time I got, got out of college, she was already in a nursing home, and I had no real home to go to. So I decided to come here to Europe, and I have spent a good deal of my adult life living here and working for American companies with foreign offices. It's a shame you didn't get to know your father better. It's such an, an important relationship. My memory of my father is very dim. Do you see your mother often? Oh, yes. I try to see her every time I get to New York and uh, for various holidays, but in her condition, she doesn't always know I'm there or even who I am. It's very sad. <laughs> well, I don't want to talk about sad things. My mother would be very happy to know that I finally found someone to wear her locket. 
And she would be very disappointed to know that once I'd given it to her, you decided not to wear it. No, I tried to <laughs> explain that. I know, I know. It's just that I love seeing you wear that locket. It, it was it was foolish of me to take it off. It was, I don't know, going home and getting back to reality. Well, before you get back to reality and home in Springfield, you and I have to have a very serious talk. Oh. And right now, I'd like to walk along the River Seine and give you a tour of the most beautiful city in the world. And we are going to talk every step of the way. <laughs> I'd love to. But no amount of talking is going to get me to change my mind. Well, as you've probably heard by now and learned by now, I can be very, very stubborn. Right? <laughs> I, I know so. this wonderful little bistro, and they serve espresso, and we can sit there oh, till dawn and drink wonderful. and talk. Mark? Well, there must be some mistake. Well, don't you remember me? Oh, I'm Why sorry, there must be some mistake. Come on, Jennifer. <clears throat> but... Well, I think Thank I've you. done just about enough work for today. But mm -hmm. Grandma and I got an awful lot of stuff, and you're going to have to go through and look through the things that you might find important. Uh. Oh, come on. <laughs> Listen, why don't we go over to Uncle Ed's and have a swim now? Now, that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> hello. Well, hello Hi, there. Hi. 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 Home. Uh, Mike asked me to drop by with these. They're records of the household accounts we took care of for Hope while you were away. I think you'll find they're all in order. Oh, I'm sure they are. Thank you, dear. When are you going to move into Mrs. Gavin's house? Oh, probably as close to the 1st of July as possible if we get everything done that we have to get done. Hmm. Listen, Ellen and I are going to go over to Uncle Ed's for a swim now. Would you like to join us? Well, that sounds wonderful. Unfortunately, I promised myself to go to Tony's karate class. <laughs> Fortunately, however, I think I'm not going to make it in time, but I want to try and surprise Hillary after class. Well, I wish you luck one way or the other. <laughs> uh, listen, if uh, Alan Michael wakes up, would you please bring him over to the pool? Absolutely, dear. Great, thanks. Excuse us. Mm -hmm. Nice Enjoy. to see you, Derek. Derek, can I get you a glass of iced tea or anything? Thank you, Bert. I, I really can't. How are things going between you and Hillary? I know you're living apart now, trying to work something out. I hope you can. Well, I hope so, too. You know, I went along with Hillary's idea of trying to put some more space between our problems, but I think all we've managed to do is put more space between ourselves. There's a real distance there, Bert, and uh, I can feel it growing. I'm sorry. But maybe that's the way it just has to be, at least for a while. Leslie Ann, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, uh, it's just about to change. Yeah, you can do that later. Excuse me. I hate it when you do that to me. What? You know exactly what I'm talking about, giving me orders like that. I resent it. And if you don't think anyone else notices, you're wrong. Well, I just wanted to remind you of the phone of the conversation we had in your car on the way to the hospital this morning when I drove you there. Uh, Floyd is about to make it real big now. I want him to start acting like it. I want him out of that hospital, and I want him out of the Reardon boarding house. I want you to convince him that he move, needs to move into a house where he can entertain properly. That isn't Floyd's style at all. Well, it should be. He's so in love with you right now, he'll do just about whatever you tell him to do. I want you to convince him that you don't want him working at that hospital anymore, that you want him to move into a house with a little more class. Do you understand? And I'm leaving it up to you, Candy, to see about changing Floyd's image. I love Floyd just the way he is. Well, that's really sweet, but I don't think he'd feel the same way about you if he knew what you were when I met you, or that you're Andy Norris's used merchandise. I want you to start putting the pressure on now, not tomorrow, today. I'll be looking for results. Rather effective, I must say that.